This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. Five years ago, deep in a bear market, a group of traditional finance experts founded BitGet and they've been building ever since. Now, with 20 million users worldwide, BitGet is committed to helping users trade smarter by providing a secure one-stop crypto investment solution with copy trading, future trading and spot trading. Your security is their priority and BitGet has one of the largest protection funds in the industry with US $300 million to cover potential trader losses from unforeseen events that are not due to misconduct from the user or platform. BitGet wants to inspire everyone to embrace Web3, so if you're new to crypto, learn more at the BitGet Academy with free blockchain courses, crypto guides, cryptocurrency trading strategies and more. Or for the experienced investor, trade smarter with daily access to institutional grade crypto market intelligence and trends analysis with BitGet Research. I've put links to BitGet Research and the BitGet Academy in the show notes, so get amongst it or simply go to bitget.com. Thank you to BitGet, and now it is on with the show. And my guest today is Trent uh, McConaughey. Trent is an AI and blockchain expert. Trent is the founder of Ocean Protocol, uh, a decentralized data marketplace. He's working on uh, a few other uh, data-related streams, uh, which we'll learn all about today uh, as well. Uh, but firstly, uh, welcome to the show, Trent. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. And just before we dive uh, right into it, uh, you're a, a fascinating character, Trent. You've actually been on the show before. I don't know if you remember, it was like way back in, um, I guess it would have been something like March 2020, just as uh, COVID was hitting. And we kind of did a, you'd written an essay on uh, just looking at what potentially could happen if, if the p- pandemic uh, got out of control and turned into a natural pandemic, which obviously it did. Um, yeah, it's funny listening back to that show now because, yeah, it was uh, uh, a strange time in the world. But um, just uh, for the benefit of people who don't know uh, who you are, do you want to just kind of give a, a little bit of a, a an overview of, of what you've kind of been doing um, in your, I don't know, personal and professional life um, and, and bring us up to date and then we can kind of talk more about um yeah, Ocean Protocol um, and, and all the data stuff. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, at the heart of it, um, I love to build things. Um, there's, sometimes there's just things that I feel like I need to build and um, get out of me in a sense and make it happen. Um, background wise, I was uh, raised on a farm in rural Canada um, and then I studied electrical engineering and computer science um, in university. Um, but even as a kid, I was programming. So, you know, that was always sort of a part of my life um, ever since I was young. Um, and then out of university, um, I had already uh, gotten into AI, hacking AI and stuff. This was by the mid late nineties. So, um, friends and I started a company, uh, uh, AI for, uh, helping analog circuit design. So AI for chip design, specifically the, the tools, the CAD tools that analog designers use when they're designing these chips. And, you know, we built that up and, um, uh, the company got acquired a few years later, um, in 2004, I guess. And then from that, I did a second company also in that space of um, AI for uh, chip design, this time focusing more on a variation, process variation and all that, helping people to verify, um, is their chip going to work, yes or no? Is is it going to yield? What level? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, And, you know, that was a really great adventure too. and ended well as well. Um, And also along the way, I did a PhD, uh, which was exploring um, AI for uh, creative a- creative uses. So um, within the world of circuits, you know, there's things that are sort of um, very engineering-y with um, less opportunity to really, really create, but more sort of paint in the lines and uh, make sure you have something that just ships. Other times you can kind of go free reign and, um, or, you know, do whatever you want in a sense and go be much more crazy and creative. So I was exploring that side of of chip design, um, where it was you know sort of open ended analog circuit design and all of this um, uh, for my PhD, and that was great fun. 
Um, these days, you know, people might call that generative AI. So a lot of the stuff that we hear in mainstream now, whether it's, you know, um, people doing uh, tom prompt engineering, uh, I, I view that simply as CAD tools, uh, you know, AI powered uh, CAD tools for, for the mainstream, right? So um, yeah, that's a bit of my background um, in the AI world. Um, and then, uh, in, uh, you know, I, I was, I'm a big nerd, so I, I follow AR and VR and, um, and all of these other things as well over the years. And so Bitcoin hit my radar pretty early on and my friends and I would hang out, about it, hang out talking about it all the time. And um, uh, in 2013, I um, had just arrived in Berlin and uh it was only then that i learned about the blockchain side of bitcoin uh, before, up to that point i was just thinking of it from the sort of financial system perspective um and that really really got interesting to me because i'm a builder and you know sort of like what sort of things can you build with this and with that um basically ended up doing three major projects around that the first was a scribe which was basically nfts on bitcoin um starting in 2013 uh, but we were too early, you know, Bitcoin NFTs really took off in 2021. So we are eight years too early. We had, you know, pretty decent traction, but not so, so good that we could uh, keep going. So in order to sort of survive as a startup, we had to pivot and we pivoted to something called Big Chain DB. That that's basically a decentralized database, MongoDB wrapped with Tendermint BFT to be precise. Uh, that was 2016-ish era. Um, it was a federated approach which meant that it was well-tuned for enterprise. Um, and enterprises were, lots of them were kicking the wheels, lots of them did kick the wheels, but um, it was you know also too early for anything going to production. So with that, we real, um, I was really missing AI and uh, I started exploring, you know, how could um, blockchain help AI, vice versa, exploring things like AI DAOs, all of this. And that's what led to um, the Ocean Project, Ocean Protocol. So we've been at that since uh, 2017. Uh, so here we are six years in and it's been a really great journey too and you know with ocean the mission is to level the playing field around data and ai and they're intricately tied right um uh ai is the engine powered by the data of uh, oil of data right or put another way if you have all this data it's ai that will take and create value from that data um and obviously there's lots of interesting societal aspects of ai and data all that privacy all of this um, and also there's, uh, you know, really exciting technology challenges, go to market challenges, all of that. So yeah, we've been at Ocean Protocol for about six years, um, you know, built everything we said we'd build and we've been pursuing, um, you know, different use cases uh, around traction, everything from, you know, enterprise level stuff like Daimler or Guy X work, uh, this European wide data sharing initiative to um, more bottom up with helping startups get going and, and sort of DeFi focused uh, projects and so on, such as time series prediction. I'm sure we'll get into that too. So yeah, that's a bit of my background. Uh, lots of AI, then lots of blockchain, and now a combination of both. Yes, yes, indeed. Thank you, Trent. And uh, you know, uh, one of the things you mentioned there, you know, you mentioned uh, I think Bitcoin NFTs and how you were perhaps uh, seven years too early. And I think you know, to take that even wider trend, that's kind of a theme of, of your life, I think. You're one of these people that has been uh, a, a little bit uh, ahead of the curve on uh, most uh, or many of the kind of uh, key underground uh, tech trends or, or ideas uh, that have since gone mainstream over the last two decades. Everything from uh, blockchain tokens, uh, big data, AI, NFTs, Moore's Law, transhumanism, uh, AI, human actualization, life on Mars, solar punk, uh, Russian doll, Tyson spheres. You know, these these are all, um, you know, fantastic ideas and they're kind of the themes <laughs> of your work. And you've been writing and giving talks on all of these, as I say, literally for uh, more than a decade. Uh, and all of these ideas are now kind of in the public consciousness, if, if not uh, the mainstream. Um, so uh, I guess I want to talk about all this stuff as well because it's fascinating. But um, it's uh, and we will. But just we'll do we'll do uh, Ocean Protocol and and, and mm. Predictor in just one second. But is it a uh, just to to kind of uh, stay on this theme for a second? Do you do you see it as a kind of a, a blessing and a curse, kind of being just a little bit too early sometimes? Uh, well, definitely. I mean, you know if. So first of all, I've asked myself, um, I obviously have these ideas and stuff. I've been thinking of crazy ideas for all my life, I think. 
Um, but also I've, I've always been a builder, not just a dreamer, but a builder. You know, Edison has talked about uh, 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. And I think that's a pretty good recipe and a pretty good balance. So, um, you know, a lot of my public stuff is the, the visionary-ish stuff, but um, I'm rolling up my sleeves every day and coding a lot and, you know, doing the, 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 the ground level work to make things happen. Um, so on the, the blessing and curse uh, too early, um, interestingly, in, uh, each of my three startups uh, was a bit too early. And the game, the name of the game is to um, manage your cash well enough to survive well enough in order for um, the world to catch up uh, in order to basically get traction, right? And, and it's a bit of, you know, uh, just people coming to, um, you know, getting past their cognitive dissonance and what's now possible. Um, and at the same time, you know, tuning your product towards um, what's easier for people to understand and use. So, um, yeah, my, the first project, it was, you know, we started off with um, super open-ended creative AI for analog designers. That was a bit too much, so we zoomed in and just made it parameter optimization. And then I went off and did the, the crazy stuff in my PhD anyway. <laughs> uh, second startup, a similar idea. And in the case of um, Ascribe slash Big Chain slash Ocean, um, we, we did the pivot. Uh, we were um, we, we explored ways to see how we could stay within the realm of of um, art, uh, you know, blockchain for digital art. And it just wasn't to be the the money really wasn't there. So um, that's why we pivoted. We stayed in blockchain, but we pivoted. What's interesting is with Ocean, you can view it as um, uh, a reframing of a scribe. You know, a scribe was about, you know, taking um, and registering um, data in the form of digital art um, onto a chain, um, claiming copyright on it, and then making it easy for other people to buy that, purchase that, and so on, right? And so it was really tuned towards digital art, um, work, work for photography and so on too. And we, we had a few users like that too. Um, and Ocean is pretty similar, especially the data marketplace side. You know, you take um, data, whether it's a CSV of your genome or something else, and you, um, uh, reg uh, you register it on chain um, and then you can sell it. Right. Um, so it's a data market, a marketplace for data for AI mostly compared to a marketplace for um, digital art. Um, Ocean itself, though, the underlying tech is much more powerful. Um, and that's what enables us to do a lot more AI -y things, things like, you know, time series prediction and so on. Um, but yeah, in that case, you know, I guess in all three cases, we have um, it, it hasn't been easy because, you know, there are harrowing times when cash is tight as a startup. But I, I've always had this philosophy that just make make it happen, right? Um, do what it takes to make it happen. Um, grind your way through. Um, there, there's you. Uh, you know, if you don't have pain in a startup, you're probably not pushing hard enough. So, um, and maybe that's you know, uh, speaking. Uh, um, Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe there can be startups without pain, but I guess I haven't experienced. <laughs> so uh, that said, you know, there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And in all three cases, uh, that's what's happened. So in Ocean's case, right, we built what we set out to build. And uh, we have, you know, interesting traction in some places. And we're pursuing um, even more traction um, in with some other hypotheses. Um, so, yeah, that, that's how I see it. But at the same time, I've, I, you know, I keep having these, you know, longer term ideas. Um, that tend to, you know, come crashing into the future faster than they were before. Um, and um, that's exciting, right? Um, so I think, you know, my crazy ideas are going um, uh, are going mainstream. It's not necessarily just my ideas. There's a lot of people talking like this, right? Sci-fi writers and so on. And they're my major inspiration as well for some stuff like this. And I like to connect the dots. Um, you know, it's easier to... Um, extrapolate the uh, sorry it's easier to interpolate than to extrapolate right rather than to say okay here's the state of the art now um what might be the next step and then step after that and step after that you know then you have it's really hard to envision but instead if you say okay here's what a future might be 10 years from now and then what are the steps to get there right and then um what you know that future 10 years from now tends to be easier to predict because it tends to be a bigger bolder thing and then you know it's up to your creative juices to figure out um the steps in between and of course, that final end post, goal post, tends to change a little bit too. But um, that's exciting. So interpolation is, is easier than extrapolation. Uh, yes, indeed. Very well said. Well, uh, I suppose then, Trent, you know, uh, Ocean Protocol, as you've said, has been, um, you know, uh, in progress, I suppose, uh, since 2017, and it does kind of combine um, three of the big themes of your work. 
um, really, you know, uh, blockchain, data, and AI. And as much as, you know, uh, the idea for Ocean Protocol would have sounded, uh, let's be honest, in, in 2017, slightly uh, sci-fi-esque, as many um, early crypto projects uh, would have in 2017. But that was only, you know, six years ago. And a, a heck of a lot has happened in the crypto space in six years, uh, as, as everyone knows. But of course, you know, the um, advances in compute really um, uh, have made uh, a whole lot more possible, certainly in, in the world of, of data and the kind of uh, pools of data that are around um, and now able to be used to uh, train large language models. And of course, uh, therefore, the, the, the field of AI has um, advanced uh, tremendously <laughs> since 2017, partly due because uh, it's really only in the last 12 months or so that um, these uh, large language models have actually been released into the wild and, and, and the general population has been given access. But this has moved the world along uh, a long way. Um, so I suppose then it'd be useful, Trent, at this point, if do, do you want to just kind of give us the state of play as to you know what what you're trying to do with Ocean Protocol uh, now, because I, I imagine there's been uh, a number of pivots uh, along the way, and some of the use cases are, are really just probably coming into uh, into view now. Um, as I say, as the compute advances, but yeah, what what, what is Ocean Protocol then? What, what what are you trying to do? Yeah, so I mean, uh, the first few years of Ocean was really about you know building to the promises of the white paper to build this decentralized data marketplace. And in, in order to do that, uh, we also had to build uh, a, a decentralized access control. Um, basically, at, at the heart of that, it's if you have 1.0 tokens for a given data set or data feed, um, it, one ERC-20 tokens, then you can access that feed, right? And it might be access it for a 24-hour subscription or one month or whatever, right? So that's the sort of heart of the, the core of the Ocean Stack. And we built that. Um, from 2017 till 2020, basically, and refined it for about a year after that too. That was our V1, V2, V3, V4. And along the way, we you know did various things. We built the data marketplace as well. Um, we built uh, something called Compute to Data, which is a, a nice pragmatic solution to privacy, especially when people are very scared about their data leaking from their premises. So instead, just bring the compute to the premises. Um, and that's part of the Ocean Stack. Um, so, and along the way too, with all of this, we were uh, constantly engaging with the community, with builders, with enterprises and so on. And, you know, several projects have been growing up um, in parallel with Ocean around the Ocean ecosystem for things like data DAOs and decentralized data science competitions and so on. Um, and then for about the last year and a half or so, uh, Ocean, uh, the core team of Ocean has said, okay, um, we have uh, built this baseline We've got some interesting traction in some places. Now, how do we um, really, really push traction, right? We've met our promises. What are some of the different hypotheses? And it turned out, you know, it's a pretty broad field of data and AI and, and uh, unlocking this. So we had a lot of ideas and we filtered, we chopped down those ideas to a much smaller group. And actually what happened is we organized ourselves in the core team to three separate teams, uh, sub teams that, you know, we talk every week and daily on Slack and all of this. Um, so we're always in sync. But each team is pursuing its its own hypotheses about where the traction might be. So it's sort of a way to sort of hedge um, possibilities. And you know the ocean uh, uh, core team, the treasury is pretty healthy. You know, it token land it can be if you're smart about treasury management. So we've been pursuing um, traction hypotheses around you know helping other startups to to build and grow and make money around data um, and uh, things like the Gaia X European wide data ecosystem. Um, things are on data challenges. And then um, one of those three teams I personally lead as well. And that's the one that is focusing on uh, time series prediction with the predictor product. So yeah, that's kind of what um, what the core team of Ocean is up to and the broader ecosystem as well, right? Pursuing, you know, within the ecosystem, say there's, depending on your calendar, there's 10 or 20 or 30 different projects pursuing various hypotheses about what could really click. And um, None of them are at like amazing traction the way that um, say Ethereum or some of the other top L ones are at or anything. But at the same time, it's it's um, very promising in many of these um, areas. So that's why we keep at it. Um, and um, I, I also, yeah, these three different streams within uh, the core team. It's it's kind of fun and dynamic, right? Because we get to um, pursue uh, several things at once and and see what clicks. 
Yes, indeed. And so you mentioned uh, predictor. How are we are we pronouncing that predictor? Uh, the way yeah. it's spelled, the way it's spelled, which uh, I guess is kind of a a play on yeah, the crypto Twitter meme. <laughs> yeah. So yep. So that's that's nicely said. Um, so yeah. Well, let's okay. Let's let's dive into predictor. So I've had a little look at this. Um, yeah, it's kind of like um, yeah, accurate prediction feeds using using data. But I'm sure there's there's obviously a, a lot more to it. Um, well, take it away, Trent. What what is predictor? Yeah, sure. And maybe I'll motivate it at a macro level, right? So please, the re there is a, a couple of reasons we really did Ocean in the first place, right? There's sort of the, the away reason and the towards reason. The way reason is, um, you know, we all see things like uh, Facebook and Google amassing huge amounts of data. And this is actually our personal data. And then they use that, they monetize it, right? Um, as Corey Doctorow has famously said, um, if you don't know what the product is, you are the product. So, you know, we are the product of Google and Facebook, whether we yes, like it or not. Absolutely. Um, and so, and it turns out society, you know, only cares about that so, so a lot less than, you know, we would might have expected. Um, but at the same time, it's still very dangerous for society. So if you can um, sort of rewire what's going on under the hood where, um, you know, large corporations aren't controlling it. And instead, you know, no single entity owns or controls it and uh, that infrastructure and you control your data. That really rewires the equation of how things could be in the future, um, and you know, to sort of help maximize the, our chance of sovereignty as we go forward. You know, or to summarize, you know, we're trying to get a, um, not accidentally land in a 1984 scenario. Um, the the towards approach is simply if you're an AI researcher um, and you're not working for Google or Facebook, it's really hard to get your hands on really good data, lots of data. It really is. Um, so how do you level the playing field around that? How do you make it easier to get your hands on it? And we, we realized that, well, uh, make it easy for other people. Like there is data lying around here and there and here and there. You just need better coordination among the people with the data and the people who might use the data. And that's where, you know, <clears throat> um, access control at the heart is there. So you can uh, you know, manage data by sending tokens to someone else. You know, your MetaMask becomes now um, your data management tool, your data key ring, if you will. Um, and of course you can have hardware data wallets, all this. Um, but then you can have data marketplaces and data commons, right? Ways to share data um, where you also can have permissions and so on on this. I mean, if you just have fully open ended data where there's no constraints at all, well, that's actually what the World Wide Web Protocol is, right? HTTP, um, you know, Tim Berners-Lee invented it. So him and his buddies at CERN, a bunch of physicists could share data amongst themselves. And then it happened to be, you know, to grow and expand uh, radically. So we actually have a really great sort of open data sharing protocol. And it, on top of it, has encryption too with uh, HTTPS, TLS, all that. But, you know, how do you give permissions to people in very specific ways, right? Say you're a medical researcher in um, Germany and you want to be able to access um, other medical data um, around Germany without um, the risk of that, you know, getting away, escaping all of this. And this is where um, uh, the idea of decentralization can make a big difference. Um, and Ocean is focusing on that, right? Um, and it really is sort of this, this middleware platform. It's smart contracts running on Ethereum mainnet and a few other EVM chains. Um, that's middleware. And then there's um, Python drivers, JavaScript drivers, um, example um, contracts on top. So that's really that's the sort of why for Ocean, um, the away and the towards, ultimately such that we have, you know, an open data economy or at least, you know, leveling the playing field as much as we can. Um, and, and for that, over the years, we've seen, OK, we've, we've come to realize and even, you know, as being an entrepreneur, like I described, um, cash is king. It's really important to be able to make a sustainable business if you want to, you know, um, be around. And of course, if the business is profitable and doing well, then you can grow, 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 grow. And, you know, we saw that in, in my previous companies, too, where the company was, you know, doubling in revenue every year for a few years. And that was really fun times. Um, so in, in the case of data, if, if you are an entrepreneur in the data space working in an open data economy using Ocean, et cetera, then we want uh, you to be able to make money easily, right? Um, and what does it mean to make money in the in the data economy? Basically, uh, the core mechanic is simply taking data, um, adding value to it with AI, um, using the you know by building a model, like you build a model, uh, you run the model um, to make new predictions. From the predictions, you take action. From the action, you make money. And with that money, you spend more to buy more data, and you loop around, loop around. You know, buy more data, train a model get predictions, 
take action, make money, loop, loop, loop. So we call that the data value creation loop. And um, it's critical for any person or organization trying to you know, get sustainable, get profitable, grow in an open data economy or any economy for that matter. But it, um, it's, it's really important and open too. You know, a lot of the time in crypto land, um, there's this bias towards nonprofit, but nonprofit doesn't mean no revenue. Nonprofit means balancing of, of revenue and costs, right? And if your revenue is starting to grow a lot, it means you can spend more money to grow faster, right? Such that you're balancing things out more. Um, so that's the heart is we want people to be able to make money in the ocean ecosystem. Um, and our various hypotheses are towards this, right? And um, Predictor then, uh, the project that I'm overseeing within the core team, uh, is focusing on um, DeFi, where it's a very fast cycle through that data value creation loop. You know, you for example, MEV people are traders. You know, it can be on the order of a minute or five minutes or ten minutes from the time you spent the money for the data until the time you've made money. Um, and uh, it's also a, a large market, right? So you don't want to be in a small market, even if it's fast. You don't want to be in a big market if it's slow. Um, the latter you can do, if but you know. Uh, given that there's a lot of markets that are, are fast, why not go for the fast ones first? So we're really tar targeting DeFi um, to start with. Um, and within that, uh, we went for Predictor. Predictor goes beyond DeFi, but we're targeting there. So here's what Predictor is. Predictor is a two-sided platform, people making predictions, we call them predictors, and people and traders, people buying the predictions. And ultimately, um, it's traders who come along and buy a feed. And that feed uh, makes predictions every five minutes of, will Bitcoin go up, yes or no, in the next five minutes? And will uh, ETH go up, yes or no, in the next five minutes? And it's a specific pair, like it's the Bitcoin USDT pair on Binance, for example. And so there's um, 10 feeds for the top 10 tokens by market cap um, for five minute head predictions, and also for 60 minute head predictions. So if you're a trader, uh, you can buy these and uh, we said you know a very straightforward price it's about one dollar per feed per day to get access to that feed you buy it and it's alpha for you right and of course the key thing here is is it accurate enough and um if there's uh zero percent uh fees and no slippage then you just need 50.001 percent accuracy right and you can make money from that but in the real world, there are fees and slippage. So, you know, fees of, you know, you know, 0 0.05% uh, or 0.1%, whatever it is. Um, and then there can be slippage too, right? 0.1% slippage, 2%, depending on when you trade. And so you still, but if you have an accuracy um, that isn't just, you know, on the razor's edge of 50.0001%, but, you know, instead 52%, 55%, if it's right 55% of the time, it's really easy to make money. Uh, even with a naive trading strategy, things like if the, the prediction says it's going up, buy, sell five minutes later. If the prediction says it's going down, sell, buy five minutes later, right? So, um, and we have a lot of internal benchmarks on that. And we're running this internally ourselves, you know, um, and making some money ourselves internally as a way to model our users. You know, ultimately our goal is for our users to make money. And so we want to make that as low friction as possible. And, you know, we want to see, you know, 10, 100, 1,000, teams in the ocean ecosystem making money uh, with Predictor and, and other ocean products. So that's the heart of what Predictor is from the trader side. Um, now, of course, if lots of people are coming along and buying these feeds, well, how are these feeds constructed? Where do they come from? So we could have just run some centralized service um, using our own data science backgrounds, et cetera, and ran that. Um, but the thing is that doesn't scale for the long term, as well as um, what if, uh, you know, is there a way to involve a whole lot of data scientists such that they can practice their data science and chops, et cetera, right? And so we said, let's crowdsource this, right? Let's crowdsource predictions. And so um, people can come along and submit predictions um, and they stake against it. So I can come along as a predictor. And I, if I believe that um, ocean, uh, that Bitcoin will go up five minutes from now, I stake maybe, you know, 100 ocean, that's $50 worth of ocean on that prediction. And if it goes up, then I make money, right? And I'll get a cut of the revenue coming in, um, me compared to all the other people who are right. And as a, um, it's pro rata on, you know, if you're right, then it's pro rata on your mode of stake. And if you're wrong, you get slashed. So that's the core mechanic um, for from the uh, the predictor side. And of course, there's you know other projects that have um, some similarities here and there. But uh, predictor is truly unique. You know, there's things like CowSwap, which is an exchange where people are running solvers 
to um, to match uh, to to match orders, right? So lots of people submit orders, and then cow swap solvers run along and run an optimization problem, and then um, they match orders. And then uh, from the user's perspective, it's just simply a dex. But from the solver, the cow swap solver's perspective, they're making money by matching orders efficiently. Um, and in our case, you know, there also is AI optimization happening. Typically, these predictors, the people submitting predictions, um, they're not doing it just by by guessing, right? Um, they could, but they would be um, at a disadvantage to anyone using uh, AI with any moderate degree of skill. So, um, you know, you can build AI ML models that take in, you know, historical data of ETH price and Bitcoin price across many exchanges and many more sources of data too. And the better you do on those predictions, then the more money you make, right? The more often you're accurate, right? So, um, and uh, you know, and there's other inspirations too. Numerai does crowdsource predictions, but it's a hedge fund. So it takes the aggregator of those predictions and uses that to create itself. And it's doing pretty well. It's a pretty cool project. Follow the, um, you know, follow them for years, been friendly with them for years. Um, and then there's prediction markets, which, uh, you know, my, people might ask, what's the difference between Predictor with its prediction yes. feeds and prediction markets? And the answer there is um, with prediction feeds, you submit the prediction up down, but you can't speculate on it. You just submit, that's it. People can't see the predictions. The only way you see a prediction is um, if you've bought um, that feed, but um, you you still can't speculate up and down. You know, once the so you have to submit the prediction five minutes or more in advance, and then at the five minute mark, uh, exactly five minutes before the prediction um, uh, comes to re to true true value, true life, um, that's when everyone else can see it. So um, this is sort of the scenario. You know, at say ten minutes uh, at the ten minute mark before until the five minute mark before, people are submitting predictions. And then the five minute mark before to the zero minute mark before, that's when the traders can see the, the see the predictions. And then um, the true value is submitted. And then um, you know, people get paid out based on whether they're right or wrong, right? Yeah. So that's how predictor works. Um, there's no speculation in between on um the price up or down. Whereas prediction markets, it's a market, full on speculation the whole time, right? So, and it's a one-off question. So it's not a time series typically, it's a one-off question, such as um, you know, will Biden win in 2024, right? And then there's, you know, a bunch of people, yes, a bunch of people, no, and they're betting on it. And then you, I, I could bet on it today, put down $100 um, saying, yes, he will win. And then maybe um, something, uh, uh, he loses some popularity due to whatever actions he takes in the next week. And people think, okay, he has a much lower chance. So a week from now, um, it goes down and I sell. So I would have lost money, right? Uh, so there's, you know, speculation in that. So that's the summary of Predictor. There are traders who buy prediction feeds um, every five minutes or every 60 minutes. Will Bitcoin go up? Yes or no, et cetera. And there are predictors who submit predictions um, in a crowdsourced fashion. And both sides make money um, if they you know, do a good job playing their game. That's the summary. Got it. Uh, thank you, Trent. And we just just to, I suppose, uh, put it back into big picture context. Uh, what is mm -hmm. the benefit uh, in 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 the real world? Say, uh, yes. we, say we have, um, you know, I, I guess the dream uh, you write of uh, on in the docs. We dream of a world of ten thousand truly accurate prediction feeds. You know, everything yes. from from weather forecast to sea level rise, traffic congestion, uh, digital asset prices, and the rest. In this uh, world, you know, just explain what the benefit is to to uh, normal uh, people where they can access uh, these kind of accurate prediction feeds. What, how does it help? Uh, yes. So, so right now, you know, um, the macro level dream is you know ten thousand or even ten million feeds, right? Um, and um, maybe I'll start. I'll motivate this with a story. When I was uh, growing up on the farm in rural Canada, it was a grain farm. And um, it's, you know, Northern Canada, right? So it snows as soon as, you know, mid-September, right? So it snows six months a year, winter six months a year. We like to joke in Saskatchewan, there's exactly two seasons, winter and construction. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I digress. Um, so growing up in the farm, uh, this means that as soon as the snow melts and as soon as it's dry, you go seeding. Why? Because you're in a race before the snow comes and you got to take your crop off before the snow. So you're in a race against the snow. So you see it as quickly as you can, as aggressively as you can, you know, come May 1, boom, 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 you go as quickly as you can. Um, you know, usually, you know, no sleep, all that for, you know, three weeks, six weeks straight, depending. And the depending is how much does it rain, 
right? And so if if you're you, and what what I noticed even when I was like six years old, um, every hour on the hour, my my father, if he was in the house, you know, not on the farm working at that that hour, he'd be like, shh, hush, shh. We'd all have to be quiet, and we'd have to listen to the radio because the radio had the weather forecast. Is it going to rain in the next hour, the next three hours, whatever? And why did we care? Because if we were out in the field and it hadn't been raining and it said it's going to rain in 30 minutes, well, we got to get those tractors out of the field before they start tearing up the field and tearing up everything that just got seeded and getting stuck in the mud. So this, you know, and, you know, if we're unlucky, we could lose half a day or even a couple of days from the mud. So these weather forecasts made a big difference to our liveliness, right? The rain forecasts in particular. And same thing in the fall, right? Um, and in that case, you know, we were combining and swathing and all this, taking the crop off. And uh, if it's rain, uh, you know, if it's about to rain, you, you got to know and vice versa too. If it has stopped raining, how much has it dried up? Um, and is it going to rain again? And when can you get back out there? And it's all a race against the clock, against the snow. Uh, so that, you know, I viscerally feel the, the value of forecasting of weather, in particular rain. Um, but it's not just for, um, for farmers, of course. Um, it is for, um, you know, forecasting is valuable in many other industries. A, a good one is... Uh, a good, another good example is energy. Uh, here in Berlin, Germany, uh, we saw last winter um, energy prices rise by three x or more. Um, you know, for people in their houses, etc. And in, in fact, this was actually throughout a lot of Europe. Um, Germany had it happen because the, the Russian oil stopped flowing, so the price, you know, the supply went down that way, as well as um, the uh, Germany shut down its remaining nuclear plants. So those two main sources of energy went away and, you know, supply and demand, if demand is the same and supply goes down, then price goes up. <laughs> and that's what happened. So, um, and some people predicted this, but you could, it would have been nice to have a lot more accurate predictions. And let's talk about accuracy for a second. So let's think about the weatherman for a second again. When he's wrong, it didn't really, it was no skin off his back. He didn't really care. Um, you know, what, um, the, we farmers cared, but if he was wrong, it didn't matter, right? Um, it really matters as well for, for energy um, usage, you know, for your house, what's your heating bill going to be? And it can be short-term energy demand too. In fact, this is really important from a national level. You don't want to have big spikes in energy needs because that will cause brownouts or even blackouts, right? Um, that's, you know, I mean, this is a crypto audience. So we all heard about how Texas had a spike in energy needs a couple months ago because of the hot summer. And so uh, the Bitcoin miners signed a deal with uh, the government to um, slow down their energy usage to help, you know, um, smooth out the load. And that's an example of, you know, demand for energy. So there's, uh, you know, energy demand matters, um, predicting that and predicting energy price matters. And I could go on and on, you know, throw a rock in a different industry and you'll find a value of predictions. And it's actually because at the heart of it, Predictions um, are bound at the hip with intelligence, right? Only intelligent creatures are able to really make predictions. And flipping it around, you demonstrate your ability to have intelligence by predicting and then acting based on that intelligence, right? You know, I can predict that the rock will fly over the cliff rather than having to throw the rock over the cliff. Or, you know, I can predict that if I walk to the edge of the cliff and step over, I will fall rather than not, right? So having a brain and not stepping off that cliff helps me not die. And then, you know, that gene pool keeps surviving, right? So yeah, that's the summary. Overall, um, uh, we're super excited about um, these accurate predictions um, for everything from agriculture to energy, um, to uh, uh, weather in general, to climate and more. And uh, the accuracy side, you know, you can do a lot of this accurately on your own, but if you crowdsource it, then you get um, really reliable accuracy over time if you combine it with skin in the game, and that's where the staking comes in. So crowdsourcing plus skin in the game um, is really sort of uh, um, the major trick here. And then of course, that's much easier to deploy um, on chain where you don't have um, uh, custody, like we as Ocean don't have custody, et cetera. It's just all decentralized, no single entity owns or controls it. And then of course we can roll out many, many prediction feeds um, with you know incentive games set up where then uh, we don't have to be even seeding those feeds with good predictions. We did this for the, the you know, Bitcoin prices and so on. But in the future, as we roll out feeds for energy and, and otherwise, uh, we there's a very good chance we won't be um, having seeding with any predictions. We'll just see what happens with the market and see what emerges.
Sounds fantastic, Trent. And so, uh, as I understand it, uh, Project was Tesla, T- Testnet is live now, mainnet soon. Um, look, as we finish off this part of the podcast, then Trent, just uh, for people who uh, would like to engage with a predictor um, and learn uh, more about what you guys are building, uh, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah. So uh, just to clarify, testnet is live and mainnet is live. It's in production um, on Oasis Sapphire chain. Uh, it has uh, We had specific privacy needs and Oasis Sapphire is the only chain, uh, EVM-based chain, that uh, has um, basically confidential um EVM. So uh, the privacy needs got met very nicely. Uh, so we shipped that in production about six weeks ago. And then about two weeks ago, we shipped an incentive program, which gives a baseline sales. So if you're a predictor uh, or would be predictor, you don't have to wait for sales to grow from, you know, zero to hundred dollars a day to a thousand dollars a day or whatever. The, we all have a baseline of sales of 37,000 ocean a week, uh, which is these days about, um, uh, eighteen thousand uh, dollars U.S. dollars a week. Uh, so that's a pretty good baseline. Um, you know, if you've got ten predictors out there, um, divvying that up, that's eighteen hundred a week each on average, times four weeks. You're talking eight thousand dollars roughly um, uh, uh, income for running a predictor in a given month, right? So that's uh, and in fact, that's the call to action too. To your question, uh, you know, be a predictor, right? Or come be a trader, buy the feeds and. Both of them are opportunities to make money, depending on your stick. And the way to do that simply is go to predictor.ai, two O's, um, and you'll see um, it's got an interface that looks a lot like CoinGecko, where you've got you know um, one row for each um, token. And then in our case, the case of Predictor, it shows what the value of, say, Bitcoin was um, 15 minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, and then uh, the prediction for um, the next five minutes um uh, as it's coming and uh, the bitcoin feed is free so you don't have to pay to see that and then the other remaining feeds um eth and dot and so on are um you have to pay for right it's about a dollar per day for just to see that um to see each feed so that's the way to engage and once you're on predictor.ai if you want to run a bot there's a button on the top right corner run bots and it will take you to a github repo where you're right in the guts of the python code and it gives you off-the-shelf onboarding you know, people have reported that they can onboard in 12 to 15 minutes. Great, great. Um, and yeah, it's running Python bots, basically. You can do whatever you want, but we we try to make it easy for, for you to run your own, you know, predictor bot doing predictions or trader bot doing trading. Got it. Thank you, Trent. And of course, uh, links to predictor and uh, Ocean Protocol uh, will or are in the show notes, listeners. I think what we do now, Trent, is we'll go to a very quick break and then I will come back and we'll finish off. I, I just want to get your quick thoughts on some of the kind of, you know, big picture ideas that have been uh, running around your head for the last decade or two, but of course now uh, seeping out into the mainstream. Uh, just be fascinating to get some quick perspectives from you, uh, but we'll do that after the break. Hey, what are you still doing up? I've just spent my entire Friday night researching Bitcoin charts, crypto glossaries. My brain feels like it's going to explode. Why don't you just use BitGet? It's going to save you at least 10,000 hours trying to learn it yourself. It's an online crypto exchange. You can copy successful real-life traders having their expertise to make smarter trades. Really? Yes, really. Don't miss out. Get on it now. And by the time you're done, Bitcoin will be worth about $100,000. I just got my cat to help me do the research. Hands off, gains up. Start copy trading on BitGet. All right, we are back, folks, and I'm with uh, Trent McConaughey. Trent, uh, as we've learned, is all about AI, blockchain, data, and putting that to good use at uh, Ocean Protocol and, uh, and now the Predictor uh, building uh, accurate prediction feeds uh, for eventually everything, really. Um, Trent, look, as I mentioned, I'd love to just finish off and, and get some of your thoughts on on some of the big trends uh, that are uh, running through the world. Um, I suppose, where should we start? Um, just look, AI, um, which of course has dominated the global conversation uh, this year and continues to do so. I'd love to get your perspectives on I suppose, uh, yeah, where where you see the current state of AI and look, let's have some fun, you know, how long until uh, AGI? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, it's it's exciting to see AI taking off. I know when I started my first AI company in 1999, um, you could count the number of AI companies on one hand, maybe two, depending how you count. So, you know, we're always tracking them and going to the AI conferences and meeting other people doing so. It's it's nice to see that it's not, you know, number of AI companies on one hand, but more like, um, you know, I don't know, 100 new AI companies every week. <laughs> so it's pretty cool to see. Um that this whole idea is becoming mainstream and the conversations that me and friends would have in, you know, the late nineties, early two thousands about, you know, can AI be creative? Uh, will AI wake up ever, et cetera. Now, you know, that's hit the mainstream consciousness. And um, I think that's really healthy, right? Um, a lot of the reason I, I like to work on AI and blockchain is that it is a high impact technology, right? Um, and I, I, I like to do things that have impact, uh, positive impact, hopefully. And um, AI and, and blockchain are at the top of the list for me. There's obviously other technologies out there too, like things like fusion or VR and all that. But just, you know, those are the two that I, I really personally gravitated towards. So um, in terms of the, the state of the art now and where we're headed, um, there's obviously a lot of discussion on, um, you know, will AI, uh, you know, get to the level of human intelligence or not? Yes or no. To me, it's a no brainer. Obviously, yes. I mean, there's nothing magical about carbon and biology. Um, they are really amazing machines, but there's nothing magical, mystical about it, right? Um, our, our brains are running um, compute and storage and have bandwidth communication around the three elements of computing. And um, there's, you know, no science or physics that says you can't have other seats of intelligence in other um, substrates. And in fact, we already have other substrates with intelligence. It's just differently shaped intelligence, right? That's silicon mostly, but other other things too. So, um, and as a, you know, trained as an engineer, um, you, you know, you learn how to even translate um, the dynamics of a system in say electrical system to a mechanical system, to a thermal system. Um, so, and that you can do that um, in a linear with linear systems very readily, but also things uh, um, can translate quite nicely even um, with nonlinear dynamics too. There's even a kid's toy out now I saw that uses spintronics um, uh, to replicate what uh, electrical circuits are behaving like as a means for kids to uh, understand how electronics work. But the point is that um, you know this debate about whether it'll happen or not. To me, it's it's not even worth you know discussing. It's so obvious. And um, yes. all it takes is a single existence proof, right? And to me, that's there's a lot of teams racing for it. Um, there's you know at least five well-funded teams in USA that are close, and probably at least as many in China that we haven't heard about, right? Um, China um, has you know declared AI to be a key strategic goal several years ago already, and poured billions into it several years ago. And already there are more Chinese papers in AI cited than there are from USA to give you a feel. So. Um, and you know the other uh, continents are quite a far quite far behind in comparison that way. So uh, it's going to happen. Um, when will that happen? Uh, I you know some another thing you have to remember is sometimes when people talk about this, when they say it publicly, if they're um, working for a publicly traded company, um, if they say something kind of half crazy sounding to some of the mainstream, um, that publicly traded company, if if its stock goes down by one percent because of that statement. That could be $5 billion, right? Like the Facebooks or Googles of the world. So you'll see several of these, you know, well-known prominent AI researchers saying things, but they won't say anything that is, you know, truly out there because they can't, they're muzzled, you know, they're, they'd get fired if they did, right? Uh, a good example is uh, Jeff Hinton. As soon as he left Google, he said, I'm really worried about AI, right? Jeff Hinton is one of the you know, world's most famous AI researchers, did a, um, did a lot of work, awesome work on AI with neural networks in particular since, um, uh, well, the 70s and 80s even, right? Um, seminal paper in the 80s and um, him and his team were one of the key teams that kicked off um, the, the current work on deep learning. Um, so overall, what's the timeline? No one knows for sure. But there's a chance that it could be in two or three years. There's a chance that it could be five years. There's a chance 10 years. Um, and I think there's an extremely high chance that it's in within five or 10 years, right? Like more than 80%, if you want a nice specific number. Yes. Um, and that is crazy to think about, right? Like it's total cognitive dissonance. <laughs> um, to And that's just, you know, human level, right? Uh, where there's um, a silicon machine that is roughly par with humans, right? Um, 
you know, already there's silicon machines that are way better than humans in some domains, things like verifying circuits, right? A million times better than humans. I know, because I helped build that stuff, right? Um, and uh, But actually sort of roughly par with humans across the board, um, that will happen within three or five years. Um, and maybe even way sooner, maybe in, in eight months, right? Who knows what's under the hood of what's cooking with um, OpenAI and so on. So well, it's it's all very tight-lipped. Go ahead. Hey. Well, that's that's right, Trent. And look, if if that's the case, if it really is, say, you know, ten years or so, um, obviously the implications for uh, the kind of rapid upheaval that uh, we're going to see around the world, uh, well, the implications are stark. No one knows exactly how it will play out. But of course, one of the uh, the big themes, perhaps, is. Um, you know, a, a reduction in the need for humans to do various levels of work, particularly uh, what we know as knowledge work, uh, I suppose, and therefore perhaps a, a need for a UBI. I know you've you've written about this in the past and and, and thought about this. Obviously, a lot yep. of the the AI community have as well. The, I guess the best known uh, example is Sam Altman's uh, Worldcoin project. Um, yeah, what, what, what are your thoughts on, on UBI and, and something like WorldCoin? Yeah, so I, I mean, at a macro level, right, um, AI, uh, there's a great chance it will take away most of the jobs, right? Um, you know, even in, uh, five, eight, ten years ago, I was talking about how um, probably the last job remaining will be AI researcher, but AI can do that too. <laughs> so, um, and everyone likes to think that it's their job that's the last one remaining, right? Somehow they're special, you know, but um, they'll be in for, you know, a, a scary surprise at some point, right? And it could be sooner rather than later in many cases. You know, the graphic designer jobs and uh, similar jobs right now are already under major threat. Um, so, uh, you know, what do we do about this uh, on the jobs front? Um, uh, yeah, like you hinted at, I have written about it going back to, I think, 2016 with the Nature 2.0 uh, wor wor works. Um, the, you know, AI and blockchain are going to be and have been generating a lot of wealth, right? So imagine if um, you could set things up with robots that aren't very smart, but they're smart enough to generate wealth. Things like, you know, self-driving, self-owning car that drives around. And once it's paid itself off to the, the factory, whether it's, you know, Chevy or Daimler or whatever, then um, all of its surplus, it dumps back to some UBI, right? Um, and then, you know, one of the uh, counter arguments is saying, well, you know, if we have UBI, um, what will people do to, you know, for their living and uh, to, to be self-fulfilled? Well, first of all, be thankful that you can feed yourself. Uh, great. And then uh, people, they really couple, you know, when people have jobs, they, they think about it in, in two ways, to feed their family and uh, to self-actualize. But, you know, the vast majority of humans aren't actually able to self-actualize with their jobs, right? There's a lot of people cooking fries at McDonald's. And so that's a bit of a myth. Um, and if you have the, you know, the free time from some UBI, then uh, it's much easier to pursue your dreams. You have more spare time, right? And what are your dreams? Well, it's whatever you want, right? Um, it could be writing the great American novel. It could be, you know, learning solidity and programming smart contracts. It could be playing video games in your mother's basement, right? It could be traveling to the Antarctic, whatever you want. Um, and it's really up to you. And that's the whole point of universal is that it's not selective on how much income you, you get based on what you do. It's, it's really up to you. And to me, um, I think, you know, why stop at basic? Why stop at just, you know, um, the basics of food, clothing, shelter, water? Why not also um, unlock to higher and higher in Maslow's hierarchy? Right. Um, so universal self-actualization income, you know, so you get health and education. But then beyond that, um, you know, enough, you know, the, the income coming to you keeps rising from the wealth, from the AI blockchain, et cetera. It keeps rising such that you do have enough money to chase your dreams. Right. Um, and this is actually pretty close to what you see if you look at if you watch Star Trek at all. Right. They don't really talk about it, but everyone basically has enough money to chase their dreams and money isn't really a concern anymore. And I heard recently that Elon is even talking about this now. He calls it universal high income. So I agree. I like universal self-actualization better because it's it's about chasing your dreams, right? USI, all that. So yeah, that's what I see um, for the jobs thing. And certainly, you know, governments will have their hands full in the next few years worrying about this and dealing with this. There is going to be probably some pretty large social upheaval around this. And um, but that's actually not the biggest problem, right? The biggest pr problem is when AI is not just at our level, par with us, but when it's 10x, 100x, 1000x smarter than us, right? 
And there's lots of talks about, okay, well, you know, we'll just control it, right? But imagine if the ants came to you, you know, the, the black critters, uh, insects on the ground, imagine if they came to you and said, hey, um, we would like you to dumb yourself down to be aligned with ant values and what we call this ant human alignment. So please, dear humans, dumb yourself down um, because we don't, you know, we prefer that we can control you, right? So uh, that's probably not going to sit too well with the AI. Yes, that's exactly right, Trent. Um, I suppose then, you know, one other thing I have in my notes, um, and I think it'd be a nice way to finish actually, because uh, uh, it's, well, I guess it's uh, one way of describing it as, 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 as a viewpoint, but it's an optimistic viewpoint. You've identified before, uh, Trent, as a solar punk. Uh, do you still identify yeah. a, a, as a solar punk? And how does the kind of, I suppose, uh, solar punk uh, worldview uh, tie into all of this? Yeah, I mean, you can be an optimistic with the world, or you can be a pessimist, or you can be somewhere in between, right? And usually the self-proclaimed realists are actually pessimists. And it takes a lot of courage to be an optimist, you know, because it's really easy to, uh, you know, be a pessimist and snark at all the optimism. So, uh, and I choose to be an optimist to build and, you know, technology has helped us build our way out of lots of problems in the past. And I see we can do that here too. So even on this, you know, uh, AI alignment challenge or AI risk, I see, you know, the way to build ourselves out is to get a competitive substrate, right? Um, and, um, you know, by brain computer interfaces or even by uploading. The challenge with both of those is the timing, right? If we're getting get, you know, AI super intelligence in the next five or 10 years, um, how can we get a competitive substrate in that same time frame? It, it feels really daunting, right? But I'm optimistic about it. We'll see what happens. There is an arms race on the AI side. So maybe there can be an arms race um, on the, you know, human super intelligence side, right? Um, and I, I think, you know, all you can be is optimistic if you're wired that way, I suppose. But, and also as an entrepreneur, right? Like I can't imagine someone starting a company if they're like, this will never work, this will never work. They just wouldn't start the company. So I'm, you know, an entrepreneur. I, I use companies and projects as a lever on the world along with technologies. And um, and that's the heart of solar punk ideas, right? Um, is uh, Is solar as in optimistic and punk as in, you know, embracing a bit of the chaos um, as it comes along and, yes. um, you know, not worrying as much about the rules, like, yes, following the law, but there's a lot of unwritten rules that you, um, that people think are rules, but you don't need to follow them. And that's really good, such as, you know, the competitive substrate. What does it mean to be human, right? Well, if we really want to have, um, you know, a, a role in the future in the age of AI superintelligence, we have to be open to the possibility that you know we might not be our meat bag selves anymore right um yeah. it might be you know imagine what it's like to be a 10x or 1000x smarter right yeah and that's gonna be with the help of silicon so that's how i see it yeah wonderfully said thank you so much trent look it has been uh, a pleasure having you on the show today thank you so much for coming and spending some time uh, with us Again, just just close it out by again uh, directing people to uh, predictor uh, and yeah, why they should uh, uh, become a, a predictor or a trader. Uh, yes, yeah. I mean, ultimately, uh, you know, predictor is uh, a, a fun way to make money uh, using DeFi and AI and blockchain um, in a crowdsourced way, whether it's running predictions or trading. And just go to predictor.ai, two O's, um, to, to check it out. And it's part of a, a bigger, broader vision. You know, Predictor itself will expand to other verticals to sort of kickstart this open data economy um, with this, you know, uh, medium, long term, longer term vision of 10,000 prediction feeds, 10 million prediction feeds for, you know, imagine every square kilometer on Earth with a rain forecast, right? And by the way, um, those 10 million feeds will be very nice fodder for training AIs as well. Absolutely. All right. Very well said. Thank you again, Trent. All the best and bye for now. Thank you very much. All right. There you go. That was Trent uh, from Ocean Protocol and uh, yeah, building Predictor uh, at Ocean. Um, yeah. Fascinating character is, is Trent. He can talk. He's got some thoughts. Um, and as I said right at the beginning, and as I think you know would have been uh, made clear uh, listening to Trent as we went through the show, you know he really has been um, writing, uh, building, 
um, talking, presenting everything really uh, with with all of these ideas uh, over the last uh, decade or two. So yeah, it's it's great that we've got people like Trent in the world um, slowly unlocking uh, the future one step at a time. And amazing to think really that yeah, this future that did seem speculative. Um, you know, as I say, back in sort of even just six years ago, um, with the advances in AI, um, man, the future is coming at us uh, faster than ever. All right. Well, hey, we'll leave it there then. I think, folks, thank you so much for listening. Please make sure you subscribe to the Crypto Conversation and whatever podcast app you are using. But that is it for today. This was the Crypto Conversation for Brave New Coins.